Hello everybody, welcome to Occulta Gaming. I'm Scott, and if you're anything like me, you've been living on Ghost of Tsushima. There's something about this game. There's something about the way it's presented, the level of spirituality that runs throughout it, the level of heart and passion, care and attention from Sucker Punch that just elevates the whole thing. I get that there's bits and pieces of it that feel sort of bolted on and feel a little bit like they're connoting Assassin's Creed, you know, tailing people and hiding in tall grass and whatever. But if you just go with whatever missions are being served up to you by just going wind to wind, just sort of piloting where you want to go and letting the wind take you, there's a really gentle, beautiful flow to the game that, like I said, I think really elevates the whole thing. So with that stuff in mind, I really think Ghost of Tsushima is something pretty damn special. And you can also check out Ewan's review on the channel. He went with a nice hearty four stars, but it wouldn't be any new release without me chiming in with some tips and tricks. Let me know your own favorites down in the comments once you've been through them, because for now, I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com and this is Ghost of Tsushima, 12 tips and tricks the game doesn't tell you. Number 12, observe leader enemies for double stance points. One thing I love across Ghost of Tsushima, especially in the story side of things, is that exploration of a samurai's code. I'm not gonna go into any spoilers whatsoever for the game, but I love the, that general idea of how you're supposed to be in the world, the way you're supposed to approach combat, and the way you're supposed to uh, hold yourself as a samurai is very much dissected across the story. Um, this is present in certain encounters, you know, dynamic encounters in the world as well, um, because when you approach a settlement and you wanna try and take some people out, um, as you acquire different abilities along the way, you'll be able to do that through assassinations. Um, this goes against your what your uncle's teachings are trying to tell you, um, but it's a lot. It's a much easier way to play. Um, factor that into the way that you observe the leader enemies, um, and if you get close enough to them and watch them perform some of their animations, whether it's a bow and arrow thing or practicing with swords, providing you're still in hiding, you can tap R2 to observe them instead, and it'll give you two leader points towards the next stance unlock, rather than the one that you get if you defeat them in all-out combat. It's way better to do it this way so that you unlock the full array of stances that Jin has, because the more different enemy types that are coming at you have a specific stance per weapon that they have, from spears to swords and shields, etc. You'll see what I mean the more that you play, but the quicker you have stances available to you, the better. Number 11, jump and press triangle to stun kick. One of my favorite things to do, and I don't know why I didn't think of this when I was, you know, for the first couple hours of gameplay, because you can do a jumping slash, is just press triangle when you're in midair and Jin will land with a snap kick instead. Um, it's really useful to punch right through some enemy defenses if you want to open someone up to stagger damage, and it just looks really cool. If you're a fan of taking photos in this game, which is another thing that I would totally recommend, um, just do one of these little kicks and then kick the photo mode on and just bask in Jin, kicking the hell out of someone, hopefully off a cliff. Number 10, use photo mode to locate archers. Speaking of photo mode, and I included this in our Assassin's Creed Odyssey tips and tricks, it is really useful to use the photo mode to pause time and just look around the environment to see where the hell those pesky archers are shooting you from. Um, in terms of annoying enemies in this game, the heavies remind me of the heavies in Spider-Man where they'll just wail right through and attack you anyway. Um, and there's nearly always one, two or five archers on the horizon pinging you with chip damage from across the environment. So if you wanna try and track down exactly where they are um, and depending on the environment that you're in, sometimes they're a bit harder to spot, freeze time, look around with the photo mode, and then just sprint in and skewer those guys first, so then you can get to everybody else. Number nine, Feather L1 for easier parries. I've seen quite a few people having trouble with the parry system, um, but it's I think that's mainly down to the fact that we as regular gamers or newcomers or whatever tend to think of parries as such a split second thing. You want to make sure you're tapping L1 the second the uh, strike is coming in, um, which is the case, but the window that you have here is so wide. Um, you can also just hold L1, which is the main thing I'm getting to. Just hold L1 so that you're always blocking and then let go and press it again. Um, even if you absorb the first hit by blocking it, let go of L1, press it again, and that next combo that's incoming, Jin will parry the next attack that's coming in. And this is one of the easier ways to do a parry within a combo, um, and it just keeps you out of harm's way. I also found out after writing my initial draft of this that there is a charm you can seek out that makes the parry window even bigger. Um, you have to go to the Spring Falls Shrine during Act 1, and you can track down a charm called the Mizu no Kami, um, which is the thing that makes it even easier to do parry. So if you're playing into that playstyle, maybe you've tied something like increased health regeneration to perfect parries, Grab this charm and it makes all of it a lot easier. Number eight, locate bamboo strikes to increase resolve. 
Now I did find over time that this eventually popped up on the loading screen, but I think when you're first exploring the world of Ghost of Tsushima, something that I would totally encourage, I love the side mission design and the overall open world design in this, um, to the point where I ignored the main story for like three to four hours and just went where the wind took me. Um, when you're in that initial act one, you know, you're in that initial sort of space of powering up Jin before you're ready to go try and save your uncle. Um, you can come across these sort of bamboo strike locations, which are small, they almost looks like a flute type icon, um, but it's a string of bamboo in descending order in one place. Um, go up to them, interact with them, and you can do a small um, button pushing mini game to get your resolve higher. Resolve is the thing that you cash in uh, for health. You can do it for certain special attacks. So the more resolve you have, the better. Seek out these bamboo strikes and do as many of them as you can. Also, if you're finding that the amount of buttons it's asking you to press in such a small amount of time is just too much, hop into the accessibility settings and you can change this to make it way more manageable. Number seven, get the traveler's attire early. I have found that the Traveler's Attire is available from a handful of different sub-bosses, so I'll just tell you where I got it from, and at least you'll know that you can go to this one place and pick it up. The Traveler's Attire is useful um, because it increases the radius around Jin that the map unfogs while you're exploring, and it also vibrates when you're next to any artifacts, Mongol artifacts or different pieces of history that you can pick up to flesh out the history of Tsushima itself. Um, if you want to get the most out of the game and get the Platinum, you're going to need a ranked up Traveler Attire eventually. So for me, I acquired mine, and I'm literally going to read my entry from the article because I don't want to get this wrong. It was from the Hayashi Prefecture Survival Camp during Act 1 at the very beginning um, where if you look to the southwest of the first Sensei Ishikawa mission um, you'll see a little encampment that you can go there, burn the whole place to the ground. No, you don't need to do that. You don't need to burn the place to the ground. Go there and find the merchant. Simply talk to him. The dude will tell you how much he's still reeling from everything that happened in the intro of the game, that big old deal that goes down, and he'll award you with the traveler's attire which does everything that I mentioned just before. Number six, swipe the touchpad right to sheath or unsheath your sword. I love this, and I don't know how many people played the old Way of the Samurai games on the PS2, um, but that game had a manual sheath unsheath option, and I always love those things in every game. Uh, the X-Men Origins Wolverine had it as well, where you could manually sheath or un unsheath your claws, um, which is one of my favorite things. Just swipe right on the touchpad, um, and there's a whole bunch of different animations that Jin has in terms of getting the blood off his sword Ninja Gaiden style, um, or just running his blade through his elbow and then slotting it back in again. It's so, so cool. and. Uh, Honestly, Sucker Punch have even factored in a bunch of specific animations. Um, if you swipe the right on the touchpad after your final kill in a group of enemies, he'll segue straight into doing one of these animations and just slot the sword back in again. It's the coolest thing. Number five, Golden Birds leads to secret locations. Now the game will eventually point out that the golden birds are the sort of keepers of the island and they know everything about the island, but that only pops up the more you stick to the main path of missions. Again, if you're anything like me, you've just been lost in the open world exploring. Um, and I actually came across a really weird glitch where one of these golden birds was just flying around my head forever and I couldn't get rid of it. It wasn't trying to tell me to go anywhere. It was just stuck above my head. Um, so I don't know if the, if the specific utility of these creatures relies on doing some main missions before it meets out even more. Point Point being though that if you meet one of these golden birds where all of a sudden it just flies in from your periphery, it seems like they're dynamically generated to point you towards items of interest. Um, I've had them take me to specific plot points, different characters, um, some of the bamboo strikes and things like that. Basically whenever you see one of these birds, don't try and arrow shoot it out the sky like I did because you're sick of it hanging around. Instead, see which direction it's trying to take you and hopefully you can follow that to a point of interest. Number four, jump into attacks to keep the pressure on. This feels like the kind of thing that might get patched out over time because as much as the game teaches you to dodge out the way of orange icon attacks, you can jump over the vast majority of them. Um, it does note in one of the loading screens that if a heavy enemy, a bigger enemy is swinging at you, there's a specific jump animation you can go into where you'll flip on the other side of them and you can keep attacking. The thing that they don't tell you though is that you can jump over pretty much anything from spears to sword swipes and everything else. Um, sometimes you'll land in another attack animation, but if you're just one-on-one -on -one and you want to guarantee a hit, just jump over whatever's coming your way, hit square or triangle, and retaliate straight away instead. Number three, use concentrate for slow motion parries and dodging. Massive props to GameSpot for finding this on their tips and tricks video, but you can use the concentration perk that you unlock for the bow and arrow side of things during melee combat. Done by pressing R3 while aiming using L2, it's perfect for getting the timing down on parries. Basically, if you're struggling with the parry system, you wanna make sure that you're pressing L1 at the right time. Just aim with L2, go into slow motion, wait for the person to come at you, and then press L1 the second they're close enough to go into the parry animation. It feels weird and super gamey and whatever that you're going from 
aiming straight into a parry, but the game totally lets you. You can kind of go frame to frame one animation straight into the next one, um, and it's extremely helpful. Also note that parries build your resolve, which can be traded in for health. If you're on the losing side of a bout, start slowing time and parrying, but don't kill your foe to get Jin's health all the way back up. Number two, you can cut through orange unblockable icons. This is so timing specific, but I got it to work a couple of times, so I'm gonna mention it. Um, you can cut right through one of the unblockable attacks if the windup is long enough on the enemy side. And um, what I mean by that is if you're fighting someone with a spear or a heavy enemy, or someone who's gonna do a big old wind up and shout at you and whatever before they hit you, if you're in the right stance or otherwise attacking with the right speed of animation, you can just get there first. It feels pretty damn cool to cut right through an enemy's cleave and finish them off first before they could even get through their animation. And number one, bow at signs, statues, and corpses for specific animations slash speech. I've just been literally bowing at every single thing. I love it as this peaceful, heartwarming gesture to just do to as many different people and beings that I come across in the open world. Um, Sucker Punch have accounted for this though, and if you bow towards any fallen Tsushima people, um, i.e. the piles of bodies that you come across when you go to certain settlements, um, or anyone who's fallen in battle, if you bow to them, Jin will say something to them, um, sort of you know wishing them well and hoping that their spirit carries on or something like that. Whereas if you bow to any fallen Mongols, he just won't say anything. Um, you can bow to all the NPCs PCs or anybody that you come across when you enter certain camps um, and sometimes that will trigger animations from them as well but for the most part you want to be doing this when you come up against certain statues. Be on the lookout for animal statues. These are the ones that seem to trigger unique animations. Um, there's a frog one that you can find that as soon as you bow at it there's just tons of frogs all around <laughs> your feet and um, there's a crab one as well where tons of crabs appear out of nowhere and um, there's a one where if you bow a, a bunch of fireflies appear and circle around you for a while. Ghost of Tsushima is all about spiritualism and magic and just taking your time and breathing in this gorgeous recreation of a chunk of Japan. Um, and I think that things like this just really help bring it to life, really give it that sense of heart and passion and care that the developers had for the old school, the history that they were bringing to life. At least all those things are what I've picked up across my runtime in Ghost of Tsushima so far. Let me know your favorites down in the comments below and if there are any other tips and tricks that you've found along the way. For now, I've been Scott from WhatCulture.com. Please check out Ewan's review of Ghost of Tsushima and I will catch you soon.